you who don't know me, um, I am the class and events coordinator for the city of Austin small business program. And um, I think you guys are in for a treat. Um, today's class on, dig on marketing psychology. Um, Chris is, he mentioned this class in another class he was, he touched on it. And I was like, that's really interesting. And he's like, I have a presentation. I said, well, you're going to give it. So um, I welcome you to small business week. We have so many events going on this week. You still have two more days to play catch up. Um, we have another Chris Aaron's class on Friday at 1130, which is e-commerce insider marketing. And um, I think that'll be interesting too. He's moderating a panel discussion. And then we have our economic development services. Um, our department is putting on um, several round table type discussions to talk about the services that we provide um, small business owners. And I think you guys will be very interested in that as well as just a few more. Um, we have a pretty large class today. So I just want you guys to kick back, relax. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. My coworker, Cassie Jackson and I will be monitoring. Chris is really good at uh, catching the, the messages, but um, you know, unmute yourself, say hello, get in there, get in the mix. We like that. And um, I hope you enjoy this because I, I think you really will. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chris. Chris, it's all yours. I'll be on mute and uh, my camera will be off, but I want you guys to, I'll remind you that we are going to put, uh, we're gonna have a little Q and A session with Chris if you would like. And then we will put in um, our poll evaluation. Um, if you could complete that, it's just two questions. It's real quick, just to let us know how we're doing. If you enjoyed the class, if you'd like to see this again somehow in a different kind of way, um, that would be helpful to me. So um, enjoy, guys. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, uh, let's give a big round of applause for the city of Austin, because uh, I don't know too many other cities. I don't actually know any other cities who put this much time and effort into supporting small businesses. And it takes a lot of time, energy and resources and money to do this and the city's committed to it. So um, I'm thrilled by it. I think it's awesome. Uh, so here we go. Uh, this is me. I think this is me, there we go. This is me. So I do a bunch of different things. I teach at uh, UT, I have my own consulting firm. But what I'm gonna talk to you today about is a is basically the kind of stuff that most small businesses don't realize and don't think about, the kind of stuff that I teach and have learned from all these big brands below. So let's start with a quick quiz, which is, for the most part, are you a logical person? Just yes or no in the chat. Okay, sometimes. <laughs> I see we have a couple of cheaters in here. Okay, that's fair. Uh, so uh, yes or no? Yes, sometimes is the answer. All right, so here's the deal. Everybody unmute yourself right now. And for those of you who had my class before, you are prohibited from answering this question. Everybody unmute yourself. And when I ask the question, yell out the answer. What color is a yield sign? Yellow. 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 Red. Red. No, red. White and red. 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 Okay, so here's the deal. Most of you said yellow. Most of you always say yellow. And that is because uh, it's a trick. And this is the way our minds work. This is the way our minds think. And so if some clown at 107 in the afternoon says, what color is a yield sign? Your brain simply says, just say yellow because yield is yellow and yield means caution and yellow means caution and all of this stuff. But this is the first thing that I want you to talk, uh, understand is that when we talk about marketing, when we talk about engaging with customers, one of the things is, is that context, context matters incredibly across everything you do. 
And the reason that most of you said yellow is because I primed you to say yellow. I said, what color is a yield sign? If I would have said, what color is this sign? More of you would have said red than yellow. Okay, now that's a real fun kind of simple trick. And I'm sure, you know, most of you've liked it. And I saw a bunch of people smiling because they remembered it from previous classes. But the thing you need to understand is that we think of ourselves as very logical, at least most of you did. Uh, we think of ourselves as being really kind of, you know, logical when we buy things and we think of our brains as kind of like supercomputers in some ways, but they're really not. Our brain is really more of a dynamic mosaic machine that takes big bits and pieces of sights, sound, images, colors, all these things, and then just plays them back to you. And it's not very accurate, by the way. And so what I want you to understand is that when we think about the psychology of our buyers, which is probably where you're making most of your marketing mistakes, by the way, is that we think people are just like us, not true. They're logical, not true. And that if we just have the best product and the best price and the best everything, we win. Also completely not true, okay? Um, so I'm gonna have a huge typo on the next slide, so you just have to um, bear with me on that. But um, your color and your eyes dictate, that's what that word's supposed to be, a lot. And so here's the deal. When you show something to your cu customer, whether it's on your website, your storefront, email, whatever it is, you are actually telling them kind of how they're going to react to it by virtue of what you put in front of them. If you show people things that are green, they become money conscious and money sensitive. They start looking for lower prices. If you so, show people with stuff with a lot of blue in it, they get very interested in going outdoors. They get very interested in outdoor stuff. If you show people clouds, they get interested in comfy stuff. And it's even to the point if you say, hey, you know, Benson, you are a very savvy guy. Guess what? Now, all of a sudden, Benson feels that he has to psychologically prove himself as savvy. So he's not going to take your first option because he wants to show you that he is savvy and live up to that rep rep representation. So all of this stuff is weird. All of this stuff is bizarre, but it's true. Even playing French music will make people buy, buy more French wine. OK, so all of this is what we call marketing alchemy. And if you don't know, marketing alchemy or alchemy is the science, quote unquote, of turning lead into gold. And that's what you guys are trying to do. You're trying to take what you have and turn it into gold. OK, gold for your customers, gold for your buyers. And this is the whole point of this thing in a world where we all love logic. And let's just be real honest right now. This last world, this last year has been an absolute crap show right? We've had a pandemic. We've had an ice apocalypse. We've, uh, small business owners have been taxed and, you know, uh, hurt like never before. All of this stuff, in addition to anything personal you had go on during this year. So we love logic because logic gives order all this chaos around us. But the problem is, is that we're not very logical people. Just witnessed by the last slide. Matter of fact, 90% plus of our buying decisions happen in our subconscious before we twitch, before we move, before we say anything, okay? And so what I want you to start remembering when you go about doing anything in business and in marketing, and this is so true in the digital age we live in, is the simple answer is rarely the best answer. And the reason the simple answer is rarely the best answer is because if it was that simple, everybody would have figured it out. If you sell, you know, $5, if you're a $500, $500 a month business or a $5 million a month business, there's probably a $500 billion a year business that would have figured that out already. So the simple answer can't always do it. So that's the bad news. The good news is that if we take a little time and learn about our customers, we can find that elegant or nuanced answer that's going to show the, us and show them as being the right brand, doing the right things that's worthy of evangelism. And one of the other things, whenever you're doing marketing, you have to think of an idea. And then the next thing you do is you call timeout and you say, what comes next? Am I prepared for the greatest thing that's going to happen? Do I have the product? Do I have the service? Do I have the support? Do I have everything lined up? Also, am I prepared for the worst possible outcome? What if this thing is an absolute dog? It is absolutely an explosion waiting to happen. Am I prepared for that? So don't always think of things as being simple 
And don't always think of things as being in a little box that's gonna happen in a nice neat package. Makes sense? All right. So real quick, we're gonna go back to chat. Why do you think people buy your products and services? Just type your answers in the chat. <laughs> because they like you, that's awesome. They want to be better like me. People want to save money, reputation, cute, encouraging. These are good. To self-actualize. So we have some deep thinkers here too. They will be happier. It satisfies them. Okay, really good answers. Functional. All right, so here's the deal. People buy with emotions and they justify with logic. And the classic example that I always give is I have a friend who bought a Corvette. And I always ask my students, why do you think he bought it? Because he tells me he bought it because it's fast and it handles well and all this stuff. And they're like, well, I don't think that's quite right. Maybe it is. But then I say he's been divorced. And all of a sudden, everybody's like, oh, yeah, I get it now. Right. I get it. So that's what people do. They justify with logic, but they're buying on emotions. And so what we want to do is we want to figure out what those emotions are and what they're trying to accomplish with this purchase. Because most purchases, almost every purchase, comes into this kind of weird thing where we're trying to do a job to get something done. We're trying to buy an outcome. You know, we go out drinking to feel better. We buy a pretty dress to make us look nice or a nice suit to make us feel better, things like this. And so we really have to understand our customers at a deep, deep psychological level. And that seems really hard, but it's not because all we have to do is talk to them. All we have to do is say and use the magic phrase, which many of you heard, help, uh, heard me say before, which is help me understand, why did you buy this product? Why, why, how did you find us? Who else did you look at? Understand what they think. And so your number one job is to understand your best customers, really better than you understand yourself, your family members, your brother, your sister, whatever. Understand what makes them tick. Understand what they're trying to get out of it. And I will give you a prime example of this. My favorite story almost in the history of the world is the fact that McDonald's wants to sell more milkshakes and they're 69 cents to make and they're $3 to sell to us. So that's a really good business. And I always ask, well, what is the hour of the day most people buy milkshakes? And most people guess the evening or the afternoon and it's 6.30 in the morning which is crazy, right? If your head hasn't been blown by just the color stuff I show you, somebody telling you that somebody's going to buy a milkshake at 6.30 in the morning is literally mind-blowingly weird, all right? But then we go back to exactly what I just told you, which is why would somebody buy this? Why would you do this? And so this is what the guy who came up with this theory called the jobs to be done theory came up with. He said, okay, I'm going to sit in McDonald's all across the country. And every time somebody like Trey or Kathy um, opens some, uh, buys a milkshake, I'm going to go and I'm going to say, why did you do this? Where are you going? What do you do? Where else have you, um, what are you going to do the rest of the day? What brought you here? Really understand them. And as it turns out, 90% of the people who buy milkshakes in the morning are men with a long drive ahead of them. Okay. And so the job to be done, the outcome they're looking for is breakfast entertainment. It's breakfast in the car, high calorie. You're not going to have to stop. It's going to keep you filled. It's going to be not neater and cleaner to eat than a donut or a bar or a breakfast sandwich, all of this stuff. And McDonald's is the perfect place to get it because there's a McDonald's on the way out of town. There's a McDonald's on the way out of almost any town and they're super quick and it's pretty reasonable. So the McDonald's shake does the job better than just about anything else. And so he said, well, let's call it the triple thick shake. And the reason that's so amazing is it sells the value, it sells the outcome. Because if you've ever tried to drink a shake through a straw at six or in the morning, you are gonna be stirring it and poking it for about a half an hour. So it keeps you busy and entertained while you're driving. McDonald's wanted to call it a breakfast shake, which is stupid because nobody wants a breakfast shake and it feels weird to get one from McDonald's. Matter of fact, I saw some of your faces squint up when I said the word breakfast shake from McDonald's, okay? So he comes up with a triple thick shake, which is awesome because nobody's gonna call their shake a quadruple thick shake, all right? And I'm gonna give you one more story on this. A uh, guy in, back east wanted to sell 
and actually built 160 different uh, or 160 uh, unit complex retirement um, homes, retirement apartment complex, 160 units. Couldn't sell them. They were priced right. They were located right. Thought his marketing was really good. You know, you look at it, it kind of seemed okay on the outside. So finally, he learns about this jobs to be done theory, and he goes out and he talks to a whole bunch of his customers who purchased the units and a whole bunch of the people who didn't purchase the units. Really important. And it turns out that when you're moving out of your big family house into a retirement community or retirement home, the biggest thing that you have to take care of is what are we going to do with the kitchen table, right? Because if you've ever had a family member who's moved out, the most important thing is, oh my God, the kitchen table. If my kids don't take it, I'm not giving it away to Goodwill. Because every meal, every celebration, every holiday had been around that kitchen table, right? And so if we give away the kitchen table, it's literally like giving away our memories. It's giving away the legacy of our family. So he hears this and figures out the kitchen table is the most important thing. And so what he does is he remodels a whole bunch of units to make the dining room bigger and the bedroom smaller, which if any of you know anything about real estate, that is a cardinal sin. Big bedrooms sell, big dining rooms don't, okay? And now those units sell out in an instant. Then he says, this is too expensive. It's taking too much time. So he then gives everybody two years of free on-site storage so they can store their kitchen table and not have to deal with it. The rest of his units sell out. That's the power of understanding what is the, the, the desire, the outcome, the barrier for somebody to buy your products. And everybody buys a product for this kind of outcome. And so that's what I want to challenge you to do is think of these things, not in a simplistic way. That's, that's again, simple is never the right answer. It would have been really easy for him to say, well, you know, people aren't buying because of X or Y or Z, but it was more complex than that because we're more complex than that. Your customers are more complex than that. We're the most incredible creatures that have ever been put on this planet. So if you ever find yourself with a simple answer, you should test it but realize that there's never been anything that's walked this earth with the brain power, intuition, and all the senses we have all working together at once. Make sense? Okay. So let's talk about how we can put these things together and how we can kind of think differently. All right. So here's a quick quiz for you. You can put this in chat. What if I came to you and said, hey, I want you to invest in a new soda company. Got two options. One tastes phenomenal. This thing tastes so good. It's cheaper than Coke. So we, you know, we're going to compete with Coke. It comes in bigger cans. So everybody's going to get more value. Matter of fact, we're even going to give it to an, uh, an eight pack. Or I have this other one that tastes like medicine, has 4X of caffeine, which is kind of cool, but it's only available in four packs. And it comes in a smaller, weirder can and costs four times more. Which one would you invest in? Cheater, Melissa. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you you guys are such liars. Number two, nobody's going to invest in number two. Why would you invest in a product that tastes like uh, calf, uh, medicine and costs so much more? And that is because that is the story of Red Bull. And if I said I was going to do this, yes, Lisa, you're exactly right. That's what it is. But Red Bull is 100% a psychological brand. Red Bull breaks all the logical rules. It tastes like crap. I'm not saying that because I don't like it. I'm saying that because the International Beverage Institute, which tastes almost every beverage on the planet, says this is the worst tasting beverage by a factor of 10. Nothing on their charts has ever tasted even close to as bad as Red Bull. And when the Red Bull people heard this, they said, yeah, all right, awesome. And the reason that they were so thrilled is because your brain, as amazing as it is, sometimes is really simplistic. If something is going to give you wings, which you all knew the answer to that before I said anything, 
if something's going to give you wings and what Red Bull's promising when it says it gives you wings is that you can do epic, whatever your version of epic is, it could be staying up late for tests, it could be sporting events, it could be a business meeting, whatever it happens to me, but it's going to give you epic. So your brain says, well, if you give me something sweet, that's not medicinal. That doesn't have extraordinary properties to it. My brain actually thinks that, and your brain does too, that if it tastes too good, it can't be good for me. And that's true. Diet Coke can be made to taste exactly, exactly like regular Coke. But if it tastes exactly like regular Coke, then you don't perceive it to be a diet beverage because it breaks the rules of how we think. So Red Bull realized this and said, okay, let's make it taste like medicine because medicine has special properties. Medicine makes you better. Medicine makes you go faster or whatever you wanna look at. And then because it tastes like medicine, we can't possibly give you a six pack. It's too powerful for an average human being to have six of these things laying around. We've gotta give it to you in a four pack. And we've got to put it in very small little weird cans so you know that it feels more like a, 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 a different thing than a Diet Coke. And the amazing thing is, is that when they sell Epic, and they sell Epic better than anybody, people who use or drive or are in Red Bull branded anything win more races, are more aggressive, and faster at doing whatever they're doing, even if they haven't had a sip of Red Bull beforehand because your brain has the expectation that you are going to be able to do epic because red bull has set that up and so that's what we're talking about is that if you set things up right you give people these little clues on how and what you're going to do they start thinking of your brand differently they start perceiving your brand differently and it actually becomes a placebo effect Okay. And you might say, okay, Red Bull, fine, Chris, I'll give you that one. But there's how many more of these products can there be? Well, here's the deal. Almost every category has one of these products. The most famous brands on the planet live by these rules. They don't live by the traditional rules. AIM toothpaste became the number one selling toothpaste in America when it came out because people perceived that if it had three stripes, it gave me three more benefits than the white stuff because everything has white stuff in it. Crazy. 94% of all toothpaste is made with the exact same ingredients. The other 6% is flavoring. That's it. But because they showed you three stripes, you perceived three to be a better, more robust toothpaste for your mouth and your teeth. And you might say, okay, that's crazy. That gets away with it once. But then Flonase did the same thing about a decade later. Flonase came out with these big ads that said, we cure six of the common causes of allergies. And everybody's like, ooh, six. Yeah, I want to get that. Well, there's eight common causes of allergies, and Claritin and Allegra cure eight. But, but because they told you they cured six, everybody assumed that six was a magic number. Make sense? All right. Now let's talk about my favorite thing, pricing. Pricing in marketing is so incredibly important. It is a strategic event to price your products. It is not a random event. It is not a simple event. It is one of the most strategic things you can do because it actually dictates how much profit you make on your products. And many of you probably have said, well, I want to be the cheapest in the market, or I need to be price competitive with the guy or the girl down the street from me. And that's kind of fine. Okay. But the cheapest is not always the best. So first of all, is $400,000 for a Rolls Royce expensive? Yes. No. Yes, depends. Nicole, we're getting closer. No. What is Rolls Royce? Bless your heart. Um, well, it's a trick question. Because $400,000 for a car, when you have nothing describing it, nothing next to it, is subject to everybody's whims. If you have a whole bunch of money, maybe it's not uh, per uh, perceived as expensive, maybe it is. But this is the deal. Rolls-Royce stopped exhibiting their cars at auto shows. Because when you put a $400,000 car next to cars that go between fifteen dollars and one hundred twenty-five dollars or 
even a $400,000 Rolls Royce seems expensive in comparison. And even if you're looking at it next to the most expensive Mercedes Benz, that's an incredibly, that's a 2X difference right there, minimum. So what do they do? They put it next to $10 million yachts and $10 million boats. Now it's an impulse purchase. Because when you've been looking at 10 and $20 million planes and boats all day, a $400,000 Rolls Royce seems cheap. And that's the psychology of pricing. How you put the context around that pricing dictates greatly whether your customer will perceive it to be expensive, to be cheap, to be worth it, to not be worth it. And that's what we need to think about. And so there's a whole bunch of things that go into pricing. Pricing is not simple, but again, we need to look at these things and understand them. So first, wine tastes better and is more expensive in a heavier bottle. If, if the bottle is heavier, all things equal, you think it's better. If the wine is more expensive, you think it's better. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Painkillers are more exp uh, expensive, seem to cure more headaches. There's no rationale for this. Chemists and um, pharmacists will tell you they're identical, identical uh, chemical compositions. For some re weird reason, chocolate bars are more valuable if they have circles on them instead of squares. Proven time and time again. If you say there's a limited time offer on a price, then people become less price sensitive because they're more worried about losing out on it. And one of my favorite things is before the pandemic, Peloton, and this is true for Yeti too, Peloton priced their bikes at $12.99 and nobody would buy them. Why wouldn't anybody buy a Peloton? But as soon as they raised the price to $26.99, they were having trouble keeping them in stock. And that's because without any kind of context next to it, the Peloton seemed incredibly cheap because most bikes at a bike store cost about $1,200 minimum. So you're going to give me a huge technological marvel with a screen connected this and classes and it's $12.99. I can't buy a cheap non-electric bike at a bike store for $12.99. So $26.99 was the price. And Yeti had the same phenomenon. When Yeti was trying to price it next to Igloo click coolers, it just seemed like it was no better than Igloo. And we'll talk about why people kept buying Igloos. And so when they doubled, tripled the price, all of a sudden these became the it item to have. So never, ever put your prices alone on a page. If you own a restaurant, describe the, the dish beautifully. Get people salivating before they see the price. If you have a dress, give a gorgeous, elegant definition of what this dress is and how people love it. And then put a whole bunch of things of social proof. Um, women who love this dress, men who have, um, if it's a suit company, men who love this suit, make sure there's context around it so people feel like this price is justified by everything that's around it. And then context changes the perception. This is one of my favorites. It's called the decoy effect. And we've all experienced this at the movie theater, right? A small little crappy box of popcorn is, seems astronomically expensive when you put it next to the big giant refillable one at 650. The one in the middle is just designed to convince you that the first one is too small and too much for what you get. And the next one is too good of a value for you to um, take it, not take advantage of. Or we could just simply say that it was $4, it's on sale for $3.50, even though it's always been $3.50, or we would have normally chosen $3.50, and now that one seems cheaper. So we can actually guide people into which option we, we want them to choose. Intel does this with a 357 processor. The 3 processor is cheap. They really don't like people buying it. The 7 processor is super expensive, and it's their most profitable item, so they overcharge for it. The 5 is the one they want most people to buy because that has the second best profit margin by just a little bit, but it's so much cheaper to make, and it's so much easier to make. So we can convince people what we want when we give them the context around it. And the context doesn't even have to make sense. If you look at this example, this is ridiculous. Who would buy digital for 12 or print for 19 when you can get both for 19? And this pricing scheme has been used any number of times for any number of different products. All it does is make people think, oh my God, 
these people are idiots. They don't know how to price their stuff. I'm getting a deal getting the print and digital for 19. They must have made a mistake. I better take advantage of that. That's the way our mind thinks. That's the way your customer's minds think. That's the way this works. That's the way humans interact as being these complex creatures with all of the psychological stuff that really doesn't make sense. Here's another one. You're gonna buy a soda at HEB. You buy it in the soda aisle, it's a couple of bucks and change, roughly 40 cents a, uh, a bottle. You walk up to the front where it's been refrigerated, all of a sudden now it's a dollar. It is almost two and a half times more expensive just because they've taken it out of the little six pack holder and chilled it slightly. But then you go to Shake Shack. Shake Shack charges $3.59 for a 16 ounce soda. And I bet almost none of you knew that, which is amazing because their sodas are some of the most expensive on the planet. But what they do is they get you to focus on the hamburger. They get you to focus on which burger you're getting. And you're so wrapped up in figuring out if you want the burger or the hot dog or the chicken sandwich, and then remembering the fries that you forget to even look at the price of the soda and they stick it to you. 359 for a 16 ounce soda is brutal. And the worst part is at Shake Shack, you've got to work to get that refill. It's not like going anywhere else. You've got to work to get that second refill and probably not getting a third one because it's a huge pain in the butt. But the psychology is of it, nobody notices. Nobody notices. And then the other thing you need to know, just like on the Peloton example, is high prices equal quality does. And this is why being the lowest priced product in any market is probably a bad idea. One is because you don't have a lot of um, revenue coming in and you don't have a lot of extra revenue to keep the business running, which is the biggest one. But two is people perceive quality based on price. The cheapest thing is the cheapest thing. It is the less quality thing. And so this is an ice cream company in Iowa that charges $16.99 a pint and they're selling out of ice cream because everybody assumes that if all ice cream is kind of the same at $16.99, this must be amazing. So think about that when you're pricing things. We generally do not go for the lowest price product because we assume it to be the lowest quality product. All right. And if this hasn't blown your mind, how much is $50 worth to you? It's not $50. It's just not. Because context, again, is everything. So $50 in cash, if you have less than 100, feels like $65 to you. And this has all been proven. $50 in cash, if you have $500 in your wallet, feels like 25 Because you have so much laying around giving, uh, you know, five, five, ten, uh, ten dollar bills or, you know, two 20s and a 10 is like nothing. On a credit card, it feels like 40 because you're not going to see the bill for 30 days. Amazon gift cards, and this is actually research I did are preferred by nine out of 10 people over $65 in cash. $65 in cash or a $50 Amazon gift card. And most people choose the Amazon gift card. And if you don't know why, it's because $65 in cash goes for utilitarian crap, gas, groceries. You give it to the kids. I'm bored already, but $50 in Amazon gift card is your world has just opened up. You can buy almost anything on Amazon. So you could buy a treat. You could buy a gift for somebody. You could apply it to a bigger purchase. Your brain and your endorphins get excited because you've just basically been given $50 to buy whatever you want. And that's exciting. 50% more of a, uh, a product is better than the same product at $75 reduced to 50% because it's feels better. It feels more valuable to us. Or break it down. $50 a month times five months feels like $5. So you've actually gotten more money out of the customer, but it feels cheaper to them. $50 is a steal if you cross out the price like we did on the last slide, right? Or the slide before. Amazingly enough, almost always $49.95 will beat $40 of an identical product. So if on Monday you part price a product at 49.95 dollars 
and then on Tuesday you price it at 40, you will almost always sell so much more at 49.95 because 49.95 doesn't feel like 50, but 40 feels like 50. 40 is a whole number. It feels big. And then, you know, a penny a day. A penny a day is roughly 50 bucks. But that's almost free. That feels free to me if you're going to give it to me for a penny of the day. So there's no actual anything in our world. There's only the world in which we construct for our customers, the pricing and the context we give them, hopefully that points them in the right direction and guides them. Make sense? Does it also work without the sense? Yes, it does, but the sense make it feel better because whole numbers feel bad. We'll talk about that in a minute, but that's a good question, Samuel. The other thing, and this is what I just love about marketing, is a flower is just a weed with good marketing. That's all it is. And if you don't believe me, we're in Central Texas, blue bonnets. 12 months out of the year, we have blue bonnets on the, uh, on the roads and highways. 10 months out of the year, they are ugly, ugly weeds. But because Lady Bird Johnson had a marketing budget, we get excited about the blue bonnets for two, maybe 45 days out of the year. The rest of the time, they're just an ugly weed. And that's what chicken wings are. Chicken wings are now the most expensive part of the chicken. Most of you in here are old enough to remember when you could not get a chicken wing or they would throw them away in the back of almost every chicken restaurant because they couldn't sell them, right? But now, because they have a marketing campaign around them, they go for as much as $12, $14 a pound if you deep fry them and put sauce on them. They're still the worst part of the chicken. But now they're a communal food that has all this taste that we're really excited about because they've been sold to you as being this really great thing where you know all the rest of the chicken is much cheaper, even the breast. And that's what we need to think about. If we can construct and put the context around something and truly sell it, people won't even notice it's $12.49 a pound. None of you noticed it was $12.49 a pound. You just think going to Pluckers and plopping down $10 for a bunch of wings and sauce is amazing, right? Okay. So what we also need to do is we should sweat the small stuff. And all of this stuff, you might be saying, okay, Chris, time out. My mind has been blown 32 times. I got a hole out the back that I don't even know what to do with now. This is just you know, I don't even know what to do with this. Well, first of all, what you should do is we should test this stuff. One of my favorite clients often says that marketing is just Latin for trying new stuff. So with all of this stuff, you should just be trying new stuff. Try some different pricing. For Samuel, who asked if 49 is better than 49.95, try it a couple of days. See what happens. Let's experiment. Let's relentlessly experiment to see what works because these are kind of generic principles or they work for a specific business. Doesn't mean it's going to work all the time for you. And I'll show that to you in a minute. Also, think about the psychology of your buyer. Act and think and walk in a buyer's shoes, your customer's shoes. We did this for a huge retailer over the summer last year where this one giant retailer came to us and said, hey, our emails are not selling nearly as much as they did before. We don't know what's going on. So we looked at their emails and there was one change we made, buy now versus shop now. The little things matter. If I say buy now, that means I'm gonna go to a cart, I'm gonna put in a credit card and I'm gonna check out. Shop now means I'm gonna see the product, I'm gonna see the description, I'm gonna see all this stuff really super important. And as long as we're talking about sweating the small stuff, all of you shop on Amazon, I'm sure. If you don't shop on Amazon, you should go on Amazon just because Amazon has most of this stuff down to science. And I'll prove it to you. Next time you go on Amazon, you're gonna see a little comparative chart about three quarters of the way down the screen. And you're gonna see the product you put are looking at right in, right in the first column, and then you're gonna see three or four more. Amazon will tell you that your product is the lowest price product if they want you to buy that product. Or they will tell you that yours is not the lowest price product, or there's another newer version in that comparison chart. They're tricking you right there. The Amazon member's choice, or the Amazon choice, 
is simply an algorithm designed to tell you which one is in stock, has the lowest returns, and they can get it to you the fastest with good reviews. It's not the best product. It's not the number one seller, but putting on it Amazon's choice next to it makes you feel like there's an assurance that this is a better product. So use these little things when you place your products, when you display your products and services. And then another one of my favorite examples is Best Buy got rid of uh, the requirement to create an account before you check out. Nobody at Best Buy figured this out, by the way. Nobody. But then somebody came in and said, hey, I just tried to check out at Best Buy, and it's really a pain in the butt that I have to create a whole Best Buy account before I can even figure out if my coupon code works, if the product's going to be shipping, when it's going to be shipping, how much is shipping, all of this stuff. So just let me check out as a, a guest and get all that information so that way I can feel comfortable with my purchase, and then I can create an account. Don't ask me to get married before we go on the date, and that's what they were doing. And so these little things are so important. So you've got to walk and feel and look at things just like your customers do, okay? And then test some really, really stupid ideas. They're not stupid ideas. It's just the rest of the world is telling you they're stupid ideas. The iPhone doesn't have buttons because Steve Jobs hates buttons. He created it because he hates buttons. If you remember in 2007, the trend was more buttons. Hell, BlackBerry was selling almost every device they could get by adding more buttons, more and more buttons. And Steve Jobs said, I just don't like it. We're going to do it. And bam, the iPhone was born. And now go try to find a phone with buttons. It's hard. It's really hard right and this is what happens we have to go and say yes the, the the logical rational thing might be the less risky but we should test or experiment and, and talk to people about doing something that's crazy that's off the beaten path and see if it works here's another wonderful idea james dyson who invented dyson vacuum cleaners went to 24 different manufacturers because he thinks, and he's a very narcissistic individual, thinks that he has created the world's greatest sucking mechanism in the history of the planet. Well, that may or may not be true, but everybody looked at it and said, why is there a clear shield? You can see all the dirt. Well, I want you to see my incredible cyclonic engine that sucks all the dirt up. And they're like, nobody wants to see the dirt. No, everybody wants to see the dirt because we don't believe it's clean unless we see it in the vacuum cleaner. It's really satisfying. It's really satisfying to see all that stuff in there. And if you go out today, you would have a real tough time buying a vacuum cleaner that has an opaque cylinder or a bag. Almost every vacuum cleaner at Best Buy, every vacuum cleaner at Amazon, has a clear cylinder because we want to see the dirt, but he was called an idiot because he broke the rule that everybody lives by. So these rules we live by sometimes don't even do us any favors. Make sense? Okay. And crazy cells. This is one of my favorite examples in the history of the world and it was created by an intern. So you don't even have to be 40 years of marketing to figure this stuff out. This is a uh, company in uh, Post Shreddies. It's a cereal in Canada. And they had to figure out how to sell more Post Shreddies because the market share was going down the toilet. And an intern said, instead of calling them regular Shreddies, let's call them new diamond Shreddies. For those of you who haven't figured this out, a regular Shreddy is a square. A diamond Shreddy is one that's rotated a quarter. 18% market share, not 18% increase in sales, 18% increase in market share. They went from near the bottom to towards the top by calling it new diamond shreddies. And the best part is that when they interviewed real customers, and this is true, and you can look this up online, people would say the diamond shreddies taste better. The diamond shreddies are more crunchy. The diamond shreddies stand up to milk better than the regular shreddies. Now, you're all saying this is ridiculous. No human being would do this, but this is absolutely true. Yes, Sammy, because they're diamonds, and diamonds are worth more than squares. We all know that. That's painfully obvious. 
So many of you have probably had a weird, crazy idea and you just dismissed it. This in turn said, no, I think this is something we could have fun with and try and people loved it. For the people who weren't in on the joke, they loved it. For the people that were in on the joke, they were all in on it. And it's the same serial and that's the important thing is that you could have spent millions of dollars coming up with a whole new technology to create some kind of new shredded wheat, designed a new box, done all of this stuff. This would have been absolutely amazing. And guess what? You still wouldn't have gotten 18% market share. And you would have to start everything from ground zero instead of getting everybody excited. So we can always try to do something that's 20% better, or we can just make something more 20% more enjoyable. We could make something 20% new, just like they did with Shreddies. And that's what Uber did. Before Uber came out, most of you don't know this, there were dozens of ride hailing or taxi apps. The problem was that when you got a taxi app, what you got was that there was some random yellow car coming from some random dis uh, dis uh, location that was going to show up. And then you had to pick out your random yellow car from all the other random cars. Uber said, no, no, no. People are anxious when they're trying to get a car. They're very anxious. So how can we make them calm and relaxed? Well, it's easy. We show them that their car is a red Toyota Celica coming from around that corner, and it'll be here in two minutes. And so when it pulls up, that's my car. And I'll pay extra for my car because it makes me calm and it makes me feel like I know what's happening and where the car's coming from. It takes all the anxiety out of getting a car. That's why Uber's Uber. It's not that there's this ride sharing economy. It's because I know which car I'm getting and it feels really comfortable. Okay. And so the other thing is that people usually buy the brand they trust more. So your brand should convey trust, which means you better be showing the prices, you better be describing it, you better have comparisons, you better have social proof, which we'll talk about showing that this is trusted. How many people here in chat are tied people? No one? Yeah, the tied you tied people uh so I've been in these focus groups. There are women, and this is their this is their descriptor, not mine. They refer to themselves as tide gals, tide girls. And in one of these focus groups, we were asking this woman, so you like tide? Oh, I love tide. Love tide. How much do you love tide? Would you try something else? And she said, I'm gonna stop you right there. If anybody in my family brings home anything other than tide, they're doing the laundry themselves. That's, that's her DMZ line right there. Like if you cross and come in without Tide, you're doing the laundry yourselves. You're not even part of the family anymore, right? And that's what Tide does. It provides these people with an assurance that Tide is going to give them a great outcome all the time. Every McDonald's hamburger tastes the same. Every Chick-fil-A hamburger tastes the same. It's an assurance that what it is. Yes, and nobody really looks at the price per ounce. But if you look at the reviews, Persil actually cleans better than Tide. But Persil doesn't have the trust behind it. Persil doesn't have all of the other stuff. So Persil fights for market share where Tide shows up and wins most of the time. And that's what you want to be. You want to be that trusted brand. Yes. And yeah, organic brands. Yeah, we'll talk about that, Nicole. All right. So the other thing you can do psychologically is you can do reciprocity or, or lean into the concept of reciprocity, which is if I give you something, you feel beholden to me. This is the concept between, you know, free samples at the food court in the mall, if you remember that, because if I gave you a small piece of chicken, you feel like you owe me something. So give stuff away, give your expertise away, give samples away. When we used to have these classes at the old um, center, well, I guess it's the fairly new center, but by the old Toys R Us, I was amazed how many of my marketing students would come in and they say, well, I own a bakery. I own this business. I own that business. And they wouldn't bring coupons with them. They wouldn't bring samples with them. Everywhere you go is a chance to get 
and show that you're the right brand doing the right things that's worthy of evangelism. That's my definition of great marketing. If you can show up and say, hey, listen, I, you know, I'm thrilled to be here. Try my cookies. Here's a coupon. Come and get an appetizer. I'd love to see you again. I just want to give you something. Most people will go just because you gave them something. But it has to be free and it has to be before you ask. And I want you to remember this. There's only two letters difference between helping and selling. What a difference, though. If I asked you right now on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate a salesperson? The average in the United States is a 1.2 out of 10. If I asked you to rate a teacher, the average is a 9.4. So help and teach your customers and solve their problems and they will love you. Give them and be the person who's helping them do it. Don't sell them. People love to buy, but they hate to be sold. They hate to be sold. You hate to be sold. So don't sell them, help them. Okay. And then we talked a little about this, which is social proof. In this very dynamic world that we're in right now, people buy because of other people. We are looking for insurance. We're looking for trust. So if I see somebody just like me, so if Benson looks like me, sounds like me, you know, likes the same things as me, and he buys something that I was looking at, then I know that is a shortcut for the, that product. People want assurance. So use logos, use real faces, use quotes. Show people just like Amazon does that this is a product that's worthy of being purchased. Take away the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And I'll prove it to you. Nobody in the history of the planet has ever purchased a product from Amazon with less than four and a half stars knowingly. Right? That's stupid. And then if you bought a product that was crappy, you probably went back on Amazon and said, oh, three stars, I knew it, I knew it, right? So make people feel that there's an assurance to what they're doing with your brand, product, or service. And use the real language that your customers use. Make sure that it's authentic and credible. It's not made up, really important. Okay, the other thing is that people really only remember two things with any experience. Remember I told you that dynamic mosaic machine, which is our brain? Well, here's the deal. We don't catalog an hour long. You're not gonna catalog this whole class. In your mind, you're gonna remember there's a peak and an end. And nobody does this better than Apple. Apple is the master at peak and end. You walk into an Apple store, you're greeted. You're ushered to the place you need to go. Or if you just say you're looking, there's a iPhone or a Mac for you to play with, and it's yours. You don't share somebody else's. You don't wait in line. There's a table. You pick yours, which psychologically says a lot. And then when you're ready to check out, here's a question for you. Where's the cash register at the Apple store? There is none. You check out in the middle before you get your product on a little iPhone and then they bring you the white bag. And as you see the woman here, and if you Google Apple white bag, you will see hundreds of people all holding up their bags. Apple wants you to remember whatever the peak was, that amazing experience of playing with this thing, getting your product solved, finding that accessory, the checkout in the middle, which is the painful thing where you give money, don't want to remember that. Then they remember that you get the bag the white bag, which we all know, and you walk out thinking everybody's looking at you. They're not, but it feels like that. It feels like that, and it feels like you're walking out on the runway of like the Oscars or something. That's the Apple experience. That's why we love the Apple store. We love it so much that there is not a store that is more valuable on a square foot basis in the world than the Apple store. Apple stores make more per square foot than any other store in the world. So when you guys think about your location, when you think about how people come in, what they experience and what they leave with, that is largely dictated by all these weird little psychological things, but just look at what Apple does. So almost everything I'm telling you, you've all noticed and you could model yourself after it, but you've gone down the simple route. I have a good product. I have a good price. It'll sell. It's a little bit more than that, okay? 
So let's go through a couple of these just to give you a few more pushes in the right direction and kind of put a fine point on it. First of all, you have three seconds to get somebody's attention. That's it. If you don't get my attention in three seconds, I'm gone. That's the way your customers think. And because you're a small business, they may not come back. Now, Best Buy can probably not do it in three seconds, but because we need Best Buy, right? Or it's close to us or it's convenient. So we have three seconds. And anytime we can get an emotional response, it's five times more powerful. So what we want to do is get people excited, joyful, something where they feel something. Okay. And then your images are incredibly important. If you own a restaurant, make the images beautiful, make the photos beautiful, make the food look like I'm going to start drooling just by looking at it, put a beautiful description next to it, and then list the price without a dollar sign, which we'll talk about in a minute. All of this conveys what it is. And when you're listing products, you should have a why us descriptor for your brand. This is the thing that tells your best customer why I'm perfect or near perfect for you. Don't give me a buffet list of features. People don't buy like that. They're not looking for, oh, I like one and three and seven and 14. They're looking for, is this perfect for me in those three seconds or is it not? Nobody's going to read your feature list and say, yeah, I like that one. Oh, that's good. And then add it up and get a value bundle out of that. And then people love faces. People want to see real faces. Real people want to see real faces. So they can, and we're good at this. You can tell a stock photo from about four miles away. You can tell stock video from about four miles away. Now, here's the deal. The people at Ken or Scott have figured out that faces don't sell jewelry. So I'm telling you people love faces, but I'm also telling you you have to test and measure this stuff because when Kendra Scott tried it, people liked the flat lay or the wrist lay because they want to see the detail in the jewelry. And actually seeing a woman's face next to the jewelry is about two thirds less important to them. So you have to test these things and know what works. And then the weird thing is if you put a baby in your ad, people are going to love you just a little bit more because we love babies. There's no rhyme or reason to it. Just babies make us feel good. It gets a little bit of emotion in there. Okay. We already talked a lot about color. So pay attention to color. Men love red prices. Women hate red prices. Yellow makes me feel anxious. Blue makes me feel trusted and calm. So your colors dictate a lot. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. For Samuel, who asked about this, there's a whole bunch of different ways to do the pricing, but there's some really tried and true things. If you're selling products that are over $1,000, don't put the comma. Because when you read it in your brain, it says 1600 you take the comma out, it's $16.99. To you, that's cheaper. To me, that's cheaper. The, the $3 versus $2 we talked about, also when you're pricing things, absolutely maximize the discount. People hate math. They hate math. If you like math, you are absolutely a unicorn in this world. People don't like doing math when they're trying to get and buy something that solves a problem and makes them excited. So don't give $10 off, give 20% off. It feels bigger. Uh, impre imprecise pricing works incredibly well, Paul. Actually, I know a guy who owns a wine store and whenever he does handwritten imprecise pricing, he sells more wine because it feels like it's a very, very calculated amount. So if he sells a bottle of wine for say, 83.54, people are like, ooh, that must be more than that, but he can sell more wine just because it feels more precise. And if it's handwritten, it feels like you calculated it down to the last decimal. On menus, ditch the dollar sign. Dollar signs remind you of price. People just want to feel if it's one, two, or three dollars. Really simple, simple. Phase out discounts. Anytime we can have scarcity, anytime we have people fear of missing out, they will buy more, they'll buy more sooner. It's really important. Um, exclusivity, people love exclusivity. People love to feel like they're special. If any of you are familiar with the makeup brand Glossier, Glossier does a tremendous job of this by making their best customers what they call it girls. And they are absolutely passionate about the brand and everybody fights to be one of the it girls, which means they buy more makeup, they buy more products. Uh, we already talked about how you can kind of mix and match. 
um, items by putting different prices to give context to them. And then one of the other amazing things is that buy one, get one free in most of your brands is going to be a far better value for your customer, but far more profitable for you. And people love BOGOs. People love BOGOs. Calm, slow music makes people calm and slow. Put stuff in the back that you want them to walk through the store. This is what every grocery store does. Make the entrance colorful. Hell, the last time you went and tried on clothes, you didn't notice it, but the dressing rooms are five to 10 degrees hotter than the rest of the store. Why? Because I don't want you spending a lot of time evaluating clothes in the dressing room. You tend to buy less. I want it hot and uncomfortable, so you do the quick try on and you take it. You leave with it. So these are the things that we have to look at. The other thing that's super important is that when we're talking about creating magic, when we talk about doing something different, like so many of the brands we've talked about today are doing, magic doesn't happen in the middle. Magic doesn't happen if we all do the same logical thing. We all just wind up in the same vanilla generic square in the center. So you've got to figure out what is the special thing you can do. What is the different thing you can do? How you can show up and be distinct, not different. Difference hard. Difference almost impossible, but you can be distinct. Coke sells happiness. Pepsi smelt, sells brown fizzy liquid. Pepsi can't figure it out, but Coke sells happiness. Coke sells you the emotion that you're going to be happier by having a Coke in your hand. That's why the polar bears work. That's why all of their advertising is not about the soda. It's about the emotion. Pepsi sells the soda and they don't do real well. So always try to see how you can become the brand in your target must customer's mind, not a brand among many. And if you do this, it really works. Here's the deal. What's the difference between Verizon and at and i I'll give you the answer. One's red, one's blue. That's it. That's it. There is no difference. T-Mobile does everything different than red and blue, including the color, which is magenta. And today, T-Mobile announced, or actually yesterday, they announced their earnings. They're the only carrier growing with net new subscribers month over month. Matter of fact, they're growing so fast, they almost don't know what to do about it. That's a really good problem to have versus AT&T that lost 175,000 customers in the last month alone. Okay, so be distinct, be the company that shows up. And this is the funny thing. T-Mobile and AT&T and uh, certainly um, all three of them sell 5G, but what T-Mobile really sells is a fixed price. You know every month you're gonna pay $35. There's no taxes, there's no fees. And on that $35, which is cheaper than most other people, we're gonna give you Netflix. We're gonna give you all these other value added services. So they're giving you a bundle for a fixed price. Verizon and AT&T are selling you 5G. Anybody here know what 5G does? Raise your hand. Put your hand down. Nobody knows what 5G is. It was a trick question, Benson. Nobody knows what 5G is. What you know is that it's one more than four and not quite as good as six. That's it. That is it. But they keep telling you that we have the best 5G instead of telling you, hey, I'm going to give you a fixed price for a great network and add some value on it on top of it. That's the difference. So look at the connections between what others have done, where others have succeeded. You need to be a student of the game. Look at where awesome marketing is. Look at the stuff that gets you to move. Ask your customers what gets them to move and see where that magic happens. It's not in the logical parts. And always, always keep looking for brands that are desperate. Desperation creates those opportunities for magic. I don't want you to be desperate. So find other brands that were desperate. T-Mobile was six months away from being sold for scrap before they came up with the let's do everything the opposite strategy, which saved the company and made them number one today. So great quote, if necessity is a mother, mother invention, then desperation is the father of insight. So find these things wherever they are and then create your magic. Think about all of the tools you can use. Think about it from a psychological perspective, a distinction perspective. Think about how you can show up and be different because otherwise you're just playing golf with one club. And then remember the simple answer is rarely the best answer. Test these counterintuitive 
frankly, stupid ideas and see if there's a little bit of merit, a little bit of magic in there. And here's the hard part for most of you. You almost all of you stuck around and hopefully you've enjoyed it. But here's the deal. You're saying, well, Chris, this is cheating. All right. This is this is just a hack. It's cheating. I, I'm not a cheater. Well, here's the deal. A good guess that stands up to observation is science. But guess what? So is a lucky guess. And a lucky guess that sets you on a new path to being the brand in the market is worth its weight in gold, dipped in platinum, wrapped in diamonds, encrusted in rubies, and then dipped in another layer of platinum, gold, diamonds, and then rolled up in $100 bills. So don't worry about the cheat. Worry about finding the secret. Worry about finding the magic where that comes. Because not everything in life makes sense and not everything that works makes sense. And this is the Rolls Royce grill. We had this earlier. If you look at this, you will swear that all of these are perpendicular, but they are not. The middle is thicker than the top and that's an optical illusion. So you will see a perpendicular, perfectly aligned grill. And that's the way the world works is that if we design for our customers and it feels right, they will buy. But if we tried to make this thing perpendicular without using that little quote unquote cheat, you'd have an ugly grill. Any questions?